Hi everyone, my name is Susan Zhang. I am a research engineer at Meta AI. I've been at Meta for about a year now and I mainly focus on large language model development. So in this talk, I'm gonna cover the development lifecycle of OPT Wednesday by B. It was a 107 billion parameter language model that we released back in May. And I'll cover kind of the challenges that we faced as we were training this model and kind of go into the details that may not necessarily be present uh, when developing smaller scale models, but are definitely very painful at scale. So without further ado, let's get started. So the flow of this talk will kind of follow the lifecycle of most ML AI pipelines, we have to figure out the data, we have to do a bunch of hyperparameter sweeps and so on and so forth. Uh, but there will be a few differences that, I, that I'll go into, mainly around how few hyperparameter sweeps we can afford to do, especially at scale, which is effectively none. And also the changes that we had to make while we were training the model, what, because we didn't have the luxury of you know, really figuring out which parameters work best at scale. So, you know, to get started, you know, we decided to train a GPT-like architecture model. So the main differences between these models as we scale up is not just the number of layers, as this kind of infographic illustrates, but also how wide these models become. So at its core, these models are relatively simple. These are just the single layer decoder, sort of this feed forward network with a little bit of tension, and you stack them on top of each other, and you know, voila, you have a big model. But if you notice, you know, in some of how these models scale up, in the case of, say, the 6.7 billion parameter model versus the 2.7 billion parameter model, there's the same number of layers, which here is 32, but the width of the model actually increases in the larger case. So you'll notice that as we scale these models, they don't really scale up uniformly in both depth and width, but rather it's kind of a step function of, you know, add a couple layers, then make it wider and so on. So after settling on this architecture, the next thing to do, or generally is the first thing, is to figure out what data we would be training this model on. So these large language models are generally all trained to do next word prediction, which isn't really that complicated, but at the end of the day, that depends entirely on the kind of corpus you feed the model to predict on. So the larger the model, what we notice is that the more fluent-like the model becomes as a function of the data that it is ingesting, but the flip side of that is that they also become very sensitive to kind of the artifacts that may be present in the data set. So things that may not show up at smaller scale definitely get amplified at larger scale, especially if there's a bunch of formatting issues or any kind of you know, repetitive text. That's the problem that we see at scale that you know, these models will overfit to these tiny details. The other thing is that at scale, these models are very, very data hungry. So you need a lot of data to feed in. And what you generally see is that people, you know, sort of dump the internet, clean it up a little bit, and then just throw it into these models. So in our case, when we aggregated our initial corpus, and, you know, of course, grew it from the version that we had before, there were a few things that ended up sort of flagging at smaller scale, which were, you know, issues with JSON encoding, so extra backslashes got added. And when we train a model on that corpus, suddenly, you know, seemed to be really good at predicting the next word, simply from predicting backslashes. Same goes for white spacing and any formatting issues, and then followed by any kind of like corpus specific structural problems. And these all becomes very tedious and manual to fix and identify. So when collecting this data sets, you know, the first thing I had to do was to blate all these new data sets that we were aggregating. And our experiments leading up to the main run consisted mostly of a data set ablation. So this is an example from our logbook which we also released, uh, where we ran a bunch of experiments figuring out which subsets of the data worked best when we're training a new model on top of it. And you know, outside of just kind of using our gut feeling, we also logged a bunch of metrics to try to figure out kind of per corpus which data sets sort of stood out relative to others. The details here aren't really, really important. I think the high level bit is to try to track as many metrics as possible in order to figure out if there's anything that may not be easily detectable just from browsing the data set itself. So assuming you've assembled your data set now and you're ready to get started, the next thing to decide on is kind of what the hyperparameters are that you want to use for training these models. So generally the development cycle at small scale is just to run you know, quite a few sweeps across a range of values for different settings and see which ones work best. At scale, however, this is kind of an exponentially increasing search space, which each run becomes much more expensive to do. So we don't really have the luxury of doing this kind of exhaustive sweeps when trying to do something like train a one-seven-billion parameter model. So 
In our case, we started off with a bunch of configurations that we thought worked well at small scale and were proven to work well at small scale. But unfortunately, we had a change when actually developing OPT 179B. So some of these include things like positional embeddings, which we changed to absolute learned positional embeddings, just like GPT-3 had, how we initialized the model, what weight decay value we used, along with you know, what we set for Adam beta 2. And these things didn't really come up until we started training with older settings and noticing that things were not working well. So this is kind of the plot that summarized why we ended up changing so many configurations of sort of after some time training at 1.7 billion parameter scale. So this is a plot of what we call run 11, which is already the 11th restart that we had at 1.7 billion scale. And all these runs were us restarting this, the same configuration to try to get the model to keep training. And you can see in the middle here, that's when things really did not go well. We had to keep restarting the settings that we were using, didn't seem to make any progress. And as a result, we did things like, you know, remove the GLU activation, switch to ReLU, go from Atom to SGD. We just tried a bunch of things only to get to the point where this pink line kind of progressed past the point that we were stuck before, but the model wasn't making any progress. So this was when we had to really go back to the drawing board to see what settings were used you know, in GPT-3 and other code bases, specifically in sort of the NVIDIA Megatron code base, which they used to train a 530 billion parameter model. And also, we also took a look at you know, deep speed to see what kind of configurations they had there and so on. So doing, doing an exhaustive search at that point sort of led us down to converge in a new set of hyperparameters that really ended up just matching kind of what GPT-3 published. So, Assuming you stabilized your training process and things are already, you know, looking much better, the next thing to hit you, or to hit us at least in this case, was infrastructure instability. So usually this isn't an issue, assuming that you have enough tooling in place and enough stress tests, but working at scale with the latest generation of hardware, there were all these things that we didn't really foresee and didn't really have tooling ready for at the time. So when we were training these models back in sort of uh, November of last year, all we were seeing was a bunch of ECC errors that are happening at much higher frequency than on um, previous generations of these GPUs. Nickel, InfiniBand issues, you know, or even working with a cloud provider, there were machines that we thought we were replacing, but turns out we weren't replacing, it just cycled right back in. So all this led to a bunch of hardware failures that we had to build some tooling again. So we developed a suite of infrastructure sort of cluster health checks to run every time we see these failures, just to flag problematic nodes. So some of these checks include, you know, burning in the GPUs, running nickel tests to check the interconnect, uh, and also obviously monitoring the training run to see if, you know, the, the progress has halted in some way and having to you know, trigger this kind of restart and rescanning the fleet to see if there are problematic machines. So this is obviously a problem that, you know, will be amplified at scale, right? If there was, you know, say 1% chance of failure on one GPU, now you have a thousand, then at a given moment in time, you know, you're pretty much bound to fail. Of course, the failure rate wasn't that high, but it turned into something like, you know, two to three restarts that we had to do per day at some point, which does get very tedious if you don't have an automation built in here. So assuming your machines are now, you know, working as expected, this now goes back to issues that we solved before, which was potentially more in-flight changes that you have to make to control for numerical instability. So even if the hyperparameters that you selected in the, in the beginning were working just fine, they may not continue working as you keep training at scale. So one of the most common numerical instability issues comes up with gradient spikes, which then leads to like these NANs happening in your model and you know, your training just completely stops because you know, these are not numbers and it has no idea how to progress. And this gets compounded by the fact that using lower precision may lead to the, the you know, dynamic range being bounded, therefore, you know, overflows and underflows happen more frequently. So we were using FP16 to start. Now, in retrospect, maybe Bflow16 might have been better, but that was one of the things we were working against, which was the limited dynamic range of FP16 and constant sort of overflow issues that were popping up while we were training these models. So to kind of try to correlation match and figure out what the root cause of this instability was, we do track a few metrics. We also do you know, per layer metrics as well, but really the three things we really looked at were the last layer activation norm, the gradient norm of, at each step, and if you have gradient clipping, which is just to truncate the gradients at some you know, value, 
that with the frequency with which that was applied was also an indicator potentially of instability. And also loss scaling, which you know in the FP16 case, because of the limit dynamic range, you kind of have to shift the range up and down depending on what where you were seeing underflow issues and where you were seeing overflow issues. When that scaling factor kind of crashes and kind of scales everything to zero, then training obviously comes to a halt. So the way this shows up in our logs is in one of our runs, uh, which we named run 12.16, that's the 16th restart in our 12th run, which is the final run that consisted of, you know, I think almost 90 plus restarts. But in the 16th restart, we were trying to get past these activation spikes, which correlated with also the gradient spiking. So in these cases, you know, you can see in the bottom plot, that's the perplexity or the loss curve, things would just start looking pretty unhealthy. And so the thing that we tried mid-flight here is to reduce gradient clipping from 1.0 that we set at the time to 0.3. All that means really in practice is that now you're clipping more aggressively. And so your gradients hopefully are a bit more controlled than before. We also had a backup plan then, you know, if that didn't work, we might have, you know, reset our atom state and maybe try to do a fresh warm up and readjust the kind of optimizer state to the current data sort of distribution, whatever that might be. And there are obviously also other infrastructure issues that were still happening at the time. So that was the other note that we took at, the, at this point, which, you know, just trying to restart the job had other you know, issues that we didn't have tooling for at the time. So this is another example of, you know, having to restart and change some configuration. Really, the thing that we had to change after clipping was just the learning rate, which might not be optimal, but given the fact that, you know, we started off with a pretty aggressively high learning rate and things were looking like they were becoming unstable again, we did the simplest thing, which was to reduce that learning rate, reduce the gradient step. And in most cases, it seemed like that helped, but, you know, obviously there's a limit to how frequently you can reduce the learning rate. If it goes to zero, your, your training isn't making any progress. So you can't really apply that, you know, ad nauseum. So assuming you made it through all these instabilities, all the infrastructure hardware failures and everything that, that came up through this process, the last bit now is that you have a model that you think is trained, but you have to benchmark it. And in our case, benchmarks in, in this space is, is kind of saturating a bit faster than people can scale up. So this makes kind of quantifying the progress that we make at scale much harder. And in some cases, what makes this even harder is that there's details in how these benchmarks are formatted and how they're prompted that really affects the performance of these models. So this is an example from the GP3 paper. If you look at the appendix and you look at some of the sort of prompts that they were using for their benchmarks, how the prompt is formatted, whether you use, you know, true, false, or neither with capital letters or lowercase letters, or what order you, you prompt it with, that changes the outcome of the model. So it gets really hard to quantify whether or not improvements are coming from formatting the prompt better and sort of getting better results that way, or if the model is truly better. So in our case, when we benchmarked OPT against the GPT-3 models across all the different scales we trained at, you can see that there's a bit of a gap in the zero shot case. So just to wind back up a little bit, this is a plot of the benchmark performance across 14 tasks that we selected, that we had an overlap between the benchmarks we ran and the benchmarks that are published in GPT-3. The number of shots here refers to the number of examples that you give the model before asking it to complete a task. So the thinking here is that the more examples you give the model, the better it performs. And of course, this, this plot kind of corroborates that, where if you give the model 32 examples in this you know, kind of purplish line here, it performs much better than giving it no examples. And you also see that there's a gap, a little bit of a gap between OPT versus GPT-3, but that gap, almost disappears if we were to just look at, you know, these 14 tasks and prompt the model with 32 examples. So this just makes quantifying imp like progress much harder, given that you can tweak all these things and then the, the, the delta of your model versus another can get, you know, become wildly different. So after benchmarking OPT and noticing that, you know, it's doing reasonably well compared to GP3, even though the corpus that we trained on was kind of just a fraction of what GPT-3 had, the decision that we had to make at that point was whether or not to release OPT into the, the broader public. So the landscape at the time was such that, you know, industry labs already had these language models to play with if they have a lot of compute. So NVIDIA, Google, DeepMind, 
these are all labs with a lot of compute budget to spend and therefore the ability to train you know these 280 billion per annum models and these 530 billion per annum language models but these models were also showing up in a few startups like ai21 labs and hybrid clova and so it just seemed like capital was really the barrier to entry here to really conduct research at scale now there were a couple of open source projects that were spinning up so Luther AI released a 20 billion parameter language model. Big Science, this group of thousands of researchers around the world, were gearing up to train a 176 billion parameter language model, which they later called Bloom. But at that point in time, there was nobody who had open sourced a language model above 100 billion parameters. And there was also a gap in kind of like what it took to develop at the scale. So all the notes that we took while training opt 175 b was hopefully something that could be of value to the broader research community to really see what it takes to train at scale that, you know, the smoke and mirrors were not as advanced as one might imagine, but, you know, just given enough compute and a couple of determined researchers, you can build a language model of this size. So our, all of our models that we trained for OPT, including all of our smaller scale ones, ranging from 125 million parameters all the way up to 66 billion, these are all publicly available for download. So you can go to our code base, Facebook research slash MetaSeq on GitHub, um, and you can download a copy of the model and play around with it. For the 175 billion parameter model, though, you do have to request access. So we are checking to confirm that, you know, if you're accessing the model, you're, you're kind of agreeing to not using it for commercial use. This is only for research purposes only. And that, you know, ideally you're affiliated with an academic institution, have a previous history of publications in the field. Because we really want to encourage researchers who previously didn't have access to these models due to you know, capital financial sort of circumstances to try to play with these models now, especially if they're doing research in this area. So that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening. If you want to get involved, you know, feel free to reach out. Our code is open source. Our logbooks are publicly available. You can get our models online. So hopefully we see a lot more development in this space. So thanks for your time.